Hey, 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 Steve, Hello. what's up? I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm ready to do a webinar. That's I'm right. Ready. <laughs> I'm ready to do a webinar, too. Um, what is, not, this is webinar, what, number 24 now? This is number 24, Profiles. Okay, okay. Profiles, Profiles and Artistic Action. And it's, we've got no, a no, great webinar. Say it like Robert Stack. Okay, say it like Robert Stack. Profiles in Artistic Activism. <laughs> Nice, nice. Thanks. And and we Go do on. we do have two uh, profiles in artistic activism. We have two amazing artistic activists who we've worked with. Um, who are going to be coming to us from across the great ether and many miles of water and so on and so forth, and talk about two actions they've done. These are people that we met when we were doing workshops. One doing workshops with transgender Europe, and another doing workshops with um, sex workers across Europe but in Ireland in particular. And these were two people, I, I would like to say they're, they were our star students, although all of our students are stars, but they were really, really stars, um, who we've then continued in contact with over the years and have worked with them to help them actualize some projects which they generated, they came up with the idea for, and they actually implemented. And what we wanna do today is talk to them about those projects right. and talk to them about the struggles the uh, the sort of impetus, how it worked, what didn't work, and so on and so forth. Basically, the struggles we all go through as artistic activists. So you want to introduce? I also want to um, sort of brag about something that we don't talk about a whole lot because we do do workshops, but we also give grants. Like we have yes. given grants to a lot of different groups around the world. We call them mini grants because um, we hold a really high standard of what a what a regular grant should be. But it's a it's a it's a chunk of money and some advising that we give and we help people develop um, action. So the idea is to train people in artistic activism and then also to provide some of the money to like take away the barriers to getting started. And um, so both of these are recipients of these mini grants. And we've got uh, first we've got Ariane. Ariane, will you? Turn on your camera and say hello. Hello. <laughs> hello, Ariane. And Ariane, you're from uh, Transgender EU, which is yeah, Transgender Europe, yep. And where are you right now? Yeah, I know you told us I'm earlier. I'm currently in Bosnia, but living in Croatia. OK. Right. Yep. And let's say hello to Kate really quick. Kate's going to be up here a little bit later. Kate. This would be a great time for you to turn on your camera. This is the prom. Up to you, though. Yay! Hey, hey, hey Kate. <laughs> and Kate is from Sex Workers Alliance Ireland. S-W-A-I. Sway. Yes. And we're going to be talking about Sex Workers Alliance Ireland um, in our second part. But, Kate, you're welcome to join us as we talk to Ariane. So, Ariane, um, why don't you start by, can you give us a little bit of background on what TGEU does and what yeah, you do? So, yep, so like I'm currently the co-chair in TGEU, so it's a regional European network of trans organizations and individuals, um, so focusing on trans rights in Europe, um, working both like with international institutions but also with local groups. Um, and well, I, so, I, when, when we worked with you, I learned a little bit about why it's so important that transgender rights in, in Europe, especially where you are and in Eastern Europe, are so important. Can you just talk about some of the issues that you're working with? Yeah, um, I mean, part of what TGU as well does as an organization is monitors violence because of all the um, issues with violence that trans people face, especially trans women, trans, like in particular trans women of color and trans sex workers. Um, so these are some issues that TGU focuses on. Some other things recently that we've been doing include, for example, uh, focusing on disability rights, so how being trans and being disabled interact and all of these things as well. Um, so yeah, like, you know, being trans anywhere in the world right now uh, has its obstacles, but then when you're also a sex worker or you're also disabled or a woman and so on, those obstacles just pile up basically yeah right right so um 
how did you, what was your original idea for this action that, that we're going to talk about? And let me know when you want visuals. Well, basically, uh, I'll, I'll let you know, yeah. Um, so since I'm based in the Balkans, uh, which is kind of this region, it used to be called Yugoslavia here many years ago. Um, and so I work with an organization called Trans Network Balkan. And so I wanted to work with this group to focus on some of the common issues we face. And one of those issues is healthcare. So we have many obstacles with access to healthcare. Um, and so we wanted to focus on eight countries in the region. Well, in our work in general, we focus on eight countries. And one of the first ideas that we had was, um, which you can also show now, was to create a website um, where we would show some of these issues that we're dealing with. Um, so for instance, to, um, yeah, so right here is like we, ha we had the idea to do like a black and white website where we would show some of the obstacles we're facing in the region. Um, and I don't know if you can see the little colorful door there on the screen. Um, that was going to be kind of a link into a different world. So to kind of imagine what would be possible if we just changed our approach. Uh, what kind of healthcare would should we have basically in an ideal world? And that was kind of taken as inspiration, both from talking with Steve here and also um, from the workshops that we attended in with TGU and artists, um, where we then imagined not just healthcare, but any issue that we're thinking about, imagined kind of what would be the ideal. And so taking that learning, like taking input from that workshop was how kind of I was inspired to come up with this idea. Um, so that was initially what we, our primary kind of focus was this. Can I, can I ask you something about Aaron? Why is it so important to project the world that we want to bring into being as opposed to all the fucked up shit that we're dealing with right now? Like, why did you take it this direction? Well, I mean, part of it might be for me personally is that I tend to be an optimist. Um, so I tend to people always kind of notice that I try to look for solutions always. So I'm not somebody who's just going to uh, look at what is uh, highlighting what is the problem. I mean, we have to do that um, in order to find solutions to identify problems. But if we kind of stay at the point of I see problems, it's harder to see those solutions. Um, so I think it helps the way we did it in the workshop as well with you was to start with visualizing what would be ideal. Um, and then it's easier to see those solutions. It's easier to come from where we are today with all these problems to coming toward at least a step closer to the world we want to see. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay. So are we ready to see what that world is? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there were, yeah, there were plenty of changes along the way. So I'll be talking about some of those. Um, yeah, so initially for, in order to create the website, our plan was to kind of talk with community members to get input from them on both the issues that they're facing, but also what they would want to see um, as an ideal solution. And so in order to correct, collect this input, we came to the idea of doing research. And that was a super long process as you know activists who had never actually done research before we uh took an ambitious bite <laughs> to try to get all the information about healthcare for trans people in the balkans um turned out that we created a survey that was like 40 pages long <laughs> <Just a survey. laughs> so that was a bit much uh so we worked with like community and people who do have experience in research as well um to try to shorten this and also to translate it into the four languages that are spoken in the region plus English. Uh, you see a slide here uh, in English where we, this is kind of the intro page of the survey um, of what the aims are and so on. Um, so that was kind of, it was an ambitious bite, but still I think worth it. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, and I love the idea that you started to, tried to crowdsource the dreams too. <laughs> yep. Yep. So we, um, yeah, TransAid, which is the Croatian trans organization, um, was a trans summer camp uh, in September last year. 
And I saw this as an opportunity to kind of combine our efforts and do a couple of workshops actually with the community members there. Uh, one of the workshops, the one you see on the left, right in front of the kind of nice C there, um, is the Imagine workshop, which was directly taken from what you do in your workshops um, with where we take something like an idea that we have, we visualize what we want to see ideally, we kind of see where we are today, and we then take both imagined and realistic kind of steps towards getting there. Um, and yeah, that was really good for community. I think they really enjoyed that. There were some interesting ideas there as well. <laughs> Do you mind um, sorry. The, would you mind sharing one of the more outlandish ones? Yeah. Um, so one of if it's I not exactly what the issue was, like they wanted to address something with the maybe it was like the legal framework, but anyway, their solution was that they were going to um, infiltrate the parliament with large uh, dildos. <laughs> Somehow this is going that's to fix not, it. That's not too far out. We could do that. <laughs> so they drew big dildos on the paper. And, yep. <laughs> so this was one interesting <laughs> idea for sure. Another one was they had, um, I think it was Putin and Trump kissing. I don't know how make it, having them make out was going to fix our problems, but <laughs> it was well, a thing. Nice to see. Why not? <laughs> I think it would help both of them immensely. <laughs> <laughs> and hence everybody else. Yes. But those ideas had, were sort of part of the process, right? Like you, you have to put those crazy ones out there to, uh, or the wild ones out there to get to the ones that you ended up using. Yeah, exactly. And the other workshop um, was focusing more specifically on healthcare. And there we wanted to kind of do it more hands-on. So we split up into groups and people could pick like a problem that they see in healthcare and either focus on showing that problem um, or focus on finding the solutions. Um, some actually did both and then they recorded this. Um, so the second picture on that slide was um, basically them recording one of those sessions where one of them is playing kind of the doctor or something and then another one is playing uh. the patient <laughs> or the trans person. Um, and the third person there is basically doing the recording. And there was the fourth person in that group who was playing a nurse. So, yeah. So then they recorded these videos, and that was also very good event to have. Cool. Um, so you got these videos, you've got these ideas. Well, then what happens? What's this? Yep. So then we also decided um, that was part of the, the like, the workshops were not at all even planned. Like, that was not something we had on our radar to even do, like the ones okay. we did. I just saw it as an opportunity when they were organizing the camp. I thought, okay, perfect. You know, I get to interact with the community. We have a few days at the coast. It's a perfect environment to kind of do this. So those workshops were kind of like just showed up. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Uh, for this other one, we had this idea initially to do like a street action where we would invite people to kind of uh, uh, come to our imagined clinic on the street um, and they could then like talk to a fake doctor basically uh, where they can play either like a trans or maybe a parent or something like that, uh, take on a role that they want. And uh, one of us from like the organizing team would play the doctor and we would kind of give them a taste of what it would be like if they're if the doctor treats them poorly but also what it would be like if the doctor treats them well so this particular picture is of the kind of good clinic where it says in croatian there a clinic of contemporary ethical medicine um so that's a good one right and yeah. then we our plans kind of had to change there as well because it was raining the day we decided to do <laughs> We were doing it in front of this LGBT center. Um, and so when it started raining, we just moved everything inside um, and invited people in. Uh, not a lot of people, I mean, strangers on the street being invited into a center, kind of a lot of them, we were not really into that idea. But we'd have like seven people participate um, as like talking to those doctors and so on. I ended up playing the doctor. So we have, I think we have a picture from the recording. Sure. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, that's when we were recording with one of the participants, and you that's also like doctor. Sorry. You look good. You look totally believable. <laughs> yeah, like I, I played the doctor. <laughs> yeah, we actually bought from like somebody had a used um, thing from. They worked in a bakery, so they had a used um, yeah thing. So we bought that second hand and used it as a prop. <laughs> And yeah, it was really good. Like we have those, uh, we have two videos like that we then use as like to show and share how these experiences were. So we have one session where it was with uh, somebody who played a parent of a trans person. Um, and they're talking about how they have like, a, I think a six year old child who is acting weird, you know, she's a girl, but she tells me to call her with uh, by a boy name, blah, blah, blah. And, now she doesn't know what to do, so she wants advice from the doctor. Um, and then, like in the first instance, we did two takes actually. So in the first instance, I kind of told her basically um, how this is terrible, and she needs to treat her child um, as a girl, and insist that she plays like a girl, and then she will become a proper girl. <laughs> right. right. And, uh, which was also an interesting experience for me to try to. Enter the shoes of kind of speaking yeah. that way, um, and then in the kind of second take, we looked at it from a more kind of affirmative uh, perspective, where basically the parent's role is just to support the child. Um, and yeah, that was really I think it was done really well. We also had some community members who were part of like the team to record these videos, edit them, and everything. So that was really great to involve community that way as well. Mm -hmm. So, Ariane, one of the things that you've said a couple of times is about how you had to change things on the fly. Yeah. And that's a pretty usual thing to have happen. And, and when we talk to Kate, we're going to talk about how her project sort of came out of that, right? But what is, what's your sort of strategy or working formula for how to switch up when you've like planned on doing this outside, we're going to have that. How do you make the change? Because that's people are always going to have to make changes. Yeah, I mean, like I think, it, just in my experience in life, activism <laughs> and so on. I mean, things usually don't go as planned, and you just kind of go with the flow, and uh, you see what what is the best you can do. Maybe you can actually make use of that change. Uh, maybe you can actually see. Okay, what? Like I remember when I was um, the reason I speak English relatively well <laughs> is that I lived in Canada for a good chunk of my life and the reason I'm mentioning it is um, when my family during the war we were like the war that was happening in Yugoslavia uh, we were immigrating to Canada and one of the thoughts like when I was preparing to leave one of the thoughts that crossed my mind was like I'm really sad to leave my friends behind but then I was like thinking you know like on the other hand what are all the opportunities I'm going to have from being able to go and get out of like the war zone and so on so like, I always try to find kind of both the positive, like even if I'm sad about something, I always try to look at the positive side of it. Also, if it's raining outside, you know, like, okay, well maybe we'll even have better lighting inside and maybe we'll have less people, but it, you know, the video will turn out looking better. You know, like. <laughs> You're a great optimist. Right? <laughs> so, um, so you, we have one more image for you. I don't want to uh, skip it. It's this, uh, it looks like a website. Yep. Am I right? Yep. Um, yeah, so then like we uh, decided to work with this idea of doors um, where we want to have like a door kind of into this world that maybe is a reflection of the current world or kind of the more negative aspects of it. And then we want to have a door that's kind of more colorful where we enter how it could be and how it should be, basically. And yeah, this is just like a mock-up that we made to, just to show here of kind of what the idea was behind that, and, uh, which is not too far from like the uh, initial idea maybe, but yeah, like we kind of changed it up a little bit to promote also the video that we made and yeah. So, um... You've got all these different elements. You were able to put them into practice, right? Um, how do you, how, what parts do you think worked really well? 
Well, for me, what worked really well was just the community empowerment, I think, aspect of it. Um, so getting people from the community to participate in all the different elements, from the creation of the survey to translating the survey into four different languages, um, where, you know, trans terminology, like talking about trans issues and trans experiences is not something, often when we have translators at certain events, they have to ask us for help with that. Like if they're translating just from English, for example. Um, so having local translators were, I don't know, Albanian, for example, and the survey is also in Albanian. So, you know, I need to know that I can trust that translator and I'm going to trust the community member to translate it in a way that's going to be affir affirmative and not like apologizing or something. Um, so, yeah, like just involving community in every aspect of the process uh, was really, I think, crucial for us. Like from the website building to the survey design, testing, um, the workshops, everything. And are there other ways that you, we got a question from one of the participants. Okay, cool. Um, that, uh, how do you determine the success of both the project and then also, you know, ultimately you want to reach outside the community to some extent, how do you measure those two things and how do you, what are the tools that you use to measure those? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I guess it depends on what you set for yourself as a measure of success in the first place, right? right like if your right. brain is to reach out to the community, then you're going to look at that more than you will at how much you engage the community. Um, so it really depends on what your goal is in the start. Um, if your goal is to reach millions of people, then yeah, you're maybe not going to prioritize empowering community members as much as you will trying to engage with mainstream media or so on. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's a great answer. And it's probably the answer that is the most valuable one for any artistic activist, which is not have arbitrary ideas of what success is, but really what does success mean for you? Yeah. Um, and, but then also be rigorous about that, right? And <laughs> say, I'm going to try, I'm going to hold myself to this idea of what success means for me. And then obviously what happens is things happen which you don't expect to happen. Right. Um, and then you kind of recalibrate what success means over and over. But it's important to have some criteria. For sure. <laughs> um, well, we're going to come back to you, Ariane. And um, if people in our audience have questions, please uh, type them in and we will, have, you know, we're going to have a little bit of time to talk at the end with both Kate and Ariane. Um, speaking of Kate, Kate, hello. Hey, Kate. Hi. Hi. And, Hi. and Kate, I mean, it was funny that Ian was taught and started talking about the idea of having to switch it up, right? And switch up what your action was because we had worked with you, I think, for a couple of weeks on this really elaborate action. And then we're like, okay, we've signed off on it. It's good. It's going to happen. And you came back to us and said, everything's changed. Do so you want to take us on that story a little bit? Right. So first of all, thank you, Ariane. So many similarities uh, between our communities, but we know that, don't we? Yeah. Um, <laughs> our, our idea originally was to hold a Mary Magdalene press conference. So our idea was to build alliances with feminist groups in Ireland. So um, because unfortunately and ironically, um, feminists um within feminism there's a great uh block and a great barrier for sex workers to being able to realize our rights so we're always trying to um to press for feminists to fight on issues around homelessness and domestic violence and poverty and um disability and drugs issues things that um that lead to um to the sex industry being particularly volatile and also people ending up in the sex industry who might not want to be there. So we are always pushing for feminists to work in, in that way um, as opposed to trying to criminalize uh, these social problems away because we know that that doesn't work. So that's um, very challenging for us. And um, we're always trying to um, push for feminists to to um, not only understand and, and for us all to realize that we're, we're 
in this fight together and that we're dealing with so many of the same issues, but that they really, really need to be inclusive of sex workers because we are the bottom of the barrel. I mean, we are the most vulnerable women uh, in society, including trans women, of course, many of whom are sex workers. And uh, so we had this idea to link with feminists, and indeed we had begun the work of reaching out to feminists from different feminist organizations to, um, to, to get this Mary Magdalene press conference going. Can I continue and tell you more about it? Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so we were going to meet with feminists and all talk about our similarities and what we have been forced to sacrifice living in a capitalist patriarchy and what we have been, um, ways that we've been oppressed. We are all going to wear masks and wigs and dresses and uh, so that we wouldn't have to show our faces and with various groups people who have um who have suffered in different ways as feminists we were going to do this public event stand in front of a cross and write and post up on the cross things that we have sacrificed as women living in ireland and read our testimony about ways that people who haven't been able to have abortions, ways that people, um, there's a group of women who were having their pelvises um, cracked to um, at a certain point in Irish history, all kinds of ways that women were being oppressed, uh, traveler women, trans women. This was our idea. Sounds great, what happened? What happened was they passed the law to, um, to criminalize the purchase of sex. They passed the law to uh, double penalties for people working in pairs or groups. And what happened is what we were afraid would happen and what we said would happen. And that was a sharp increase of violence. And it was very stark, and um, we had to address it. And that is the only thing we could address in that in that moment. And, right. and explain that for a second. Violence because it pushed sex work underground and in the shadows and kept sex workers from working together in solidarity with one another? Uh, I think there are many ways that it combined to make sex workers more vulnerable. Some of them were very, uh, very concrete. Like, for example, um, I started answering the phone to potential clients, and they would say to me, are you alone? And normally that would have been a red flag for me. Right. Why does this right. person want to know if I'm alone? But it became clear to me that um, even good clients were asking this because they thought, if I'm going to get arrested, it's going to be as being swept up in one of these brothel raids. So that became um, a screening measure, a red flag that was thrown out the window. Right. Right. Indeed, we had a meeting with victims of this first spate of violence, which was indeed on Brazilian trans women specifically. And um, we gathered them together to talk to them, to talk to them about reporting uh, the violence. And indeed, one of them had said to us that her attacker had said to her on the phone, are you alone? So mm. this is a small way that our screening systems were compromised. Um, also, people, people didn't want to report to the police. They had even more reasons to... Um, to not want to draw attention to themselves, you know, least of all to get their income taken away as their clients could be harvested as criminals. Mm -hmm. So, and, and also there was just a heightened awareness, and this is a catch-22 for us, there was a heightened awareness of our vulnerability, and there was a heightened awareness of, um, of our reticence to report. And so we, came, we became further targets of violence. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? 
Well, how did you respond? The environment changes overnight, and this happens all the time when we're activists. Yeah. And so at one time you're thinking about creating this sort of cross-feminist alliance, and next thing you're like, we're dying on the streets. So what do we do? Yeah. How, what do you, how did you respond? Yeah, I mean, we definitely had to to regroup. And I mean, the first thing we thought is, okay, this Mary Magdalene idea is great and it's wonderful and it's very important. And humor is a very powerful tool that can't be underestimated. Um, but in this moment, uh, I think we need to, to, uh, to, to rally the troops around the issue of uh, violence against us in this moment and the seriousness of that in that moment and to find a way for sex workers to be able to tell their story to share their perspective when we just can't mm. because so many just cannot show their faces cannot out themselves at all so that's mm. what the project became about and how did you do it well, we decided to do a photography um, project, and we thought this would be a good way for basically people to have something to kind of hide behind. So for people to, to get together, and you can see here, we sat with workers and we said, what is it you would say to people if you could? What are the things that people think about us that aren't true? What are you sick of hearing? and you would like to set the record straight. Mm -hmm. And just um, let people really almost free associate around all of this so that they could get all of these things off their chest, be in an environment finally that's not as isolating as the work inherently is. And decide amongst themselves, because I wasn't gonna take pictures myself, what it is they wanted to show to the world. So, um, what, um, are these cakes relevant? Or are these little pies? What are these? It was Christmas, and so those are mince pies. Okay, uh, all right. Thank you. What is, relevant, yeah. what is relevant here is that, and you'll notice throughout the pictures, there are maybe two pictures with people in them at all, and yeah. no faces. And we take a lot of these hands uh, pictures because people can't show their faces and they can't out themselves. They're afraid of getting their children taken off of them or losing their house or losing their other work, etc. So it was actually very poignant that when we finally end up having the event, um, in fact, only one worker could even feel safe to show up at all. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so tell us, this is you installing the show, I think, right? That's another um, petite blonde woman. Well, uh, not you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is us, yes. And yeah, this is at the Outhouse, which is a wonderful LGBTQ uh, center. And we took these pictures and we got a WhatsApp group together and we shared the pictures and we had a few meetings and we brainstormed around captions. And the idea was to put up these pictures and on the day, on the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers, to put them out on Twitter. Nobody in the group currently had a Twitter account. So I think that was kind of an empowering moment in and of itself. And, and to put up a Twitter account and to tweet these pictures and let people from the World Wide Web r respond to us, but on our terms. Because so right. often people say stuff in the media about sex workers, and then we have to come back and we have to be on the defense, and they've set the terrain. And this is a way for us to direct our narrative. Right, mm -hmm. right. So um, we've got these photos. You're in, you're installing them. I think we're going to come back to this show that you put together. But tell me about these. You you sent a couple of these photos. Yes. Um, can I just speak to just to that one picture before just to say what that fellow was doing there was lighting a candle um, because what we did with that space there is um, we had candles for the um, amount of women that we know of, workers I should say, um, in Ireland who have been murdered. And so we had a candle for each of the um, 
sex workers. And then above, we let people who attend the event either write a message to them or write a message in solidarity to the participants of this project who still were in circumstances because of societal stigma, um, feeling that it was true for them that they couldn't show up. So it was very nice space here. That's what that yeah. man was doing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And the how many, just quickly with the number of candles, like how far back are you going? That was, um, that was the 70s, I think. So, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. And many, tell me about this ornament. Many. What's that? Too many, of course. Uh, but tell me about this ornament, sorry. So what was coming up for a lot of people is they wanted people, they wanted society to know how normal we are yep. and how normal our lives are in some ways. And, and um, overwhelmingly, sex workers are mothers, um, like very overwhelmingly. And um, so this was a nice one because, you know, this is a woman who um, she has a couple kids and, um, and she's just done everything she's done and worked so hard as a sex worker to provide the best life she can for her kids. And right. they agree that she's done a very good job. <laughs> and you, what really impresses me about this, and maybe we can go to the next two or three yeah. as well, or one or two, is exactly this, which is when you hear about a photo exhibit about sex work, your mind immediately goes to black and white photos showing, you know, the uh, people Wait, out on the street and, you know, the sort of poverty porn um, documentary work. And what was just so remarkable about this when you both talked to us about it and then we looked at things is like how assertively every day it is. Mm. And there's something just so beautiful about that. Yes. You know, you give a camera to a sex worker, what do they take a picture of? <gasps> A bicycle. Bicycle bell. <laughs> yes. So anyway, talk about this. Wait for it. It's like, right. yeah. I mean, this woman, to her, this represented uh, the the freedom that that doing sex work has given her in her life, and also it's what she does in between clients because it can be a bit. Um, I suppose stuffy sometimes you're sitting in one room and you're you're by yourself generally and so in between clients she gets on her bike and she tears down the path by the river to just get some space and just um be able to yeah to breathe a bit mm -hmm. a lot of the pictures like you said i mean a lot of them were people um, studying while they're working. One of them was again a museum that that a girl was went to on her way to work. You know, right. so right. Mm. Mm. Um, <laughs> this was the same woman. Now I like this because um, I think it's funny. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> what it is is a bad afternoon. It's a, it's a bad half hour anyways, but it's pretty, it's typical. It's the kind of BS that we're um, used to. And, um, you know, and, and, and these are people that have called and they have been just what we would call time wasters. And um, so here you can see it's a bit of levity around how we perceive these uh, people and, you know, some other ones would be even funny. It's like, you know, fucking asshole or what, whatever, just really, you know, sounded like a pig or something, you know, like, um, and um, so this is, this is to show kind of how, how we can kind of have a bit of like humor, taking things, um, taking things uh, lightly in a way that are that are coming our way. But also what this is around is our, our screening systems. Yeah. Because um, we do have um, screening systems. We have ugly mugs um, uh, forums where you can where you can essentially check a, a person's. Uh, you can check out a person and find out if they have tried to be a bullshit client for other people. But mm -hmm. these systems are um, are being threatened, and particularly like in the United States this FOSTA and SESTA, they've passed these bills to, um, to make it illegal to, to advertise online. And this has been a huge deal in America recently. And it's in the name of anti-trafficking, but 
not only has it made it harder to screen clients, um, but it's made trafficking victims disappear. I mean, the, these websites, um, trafficking victims, when, they're, when they were there, were on them and could be tracked, and now they have disappeared. So it's, um, right. it's, it's a very um, um, inefficient way of, of, of tackling what could be tackled with anti-trafficking legislation or, like I said, the areas of life around poverty and border issues that lead to people being susceptible to traffickers. So right. write your senators, write your senators. <laughs> we will definitely come back to that one. <laughs> so, um, you, uh, there's a writing component to this too, it appears. Yeah. And, and yeah, this woman, this was really important for her. I, I told people you can write a bio, you can say it can be a fake bio, it can be j just in the way that people don't want to tell their names kind of thing. If they just want to write about their sex worker persona, fine, go on and, and, and do that, you know. You can be the person that you are at work. Other people chose to be anonymous. This woman wanted to, wanted to write her story of how she ended up in sex work because it's a really important perspective to be included because she hates it. People yeah. think people hear sex worker rights and they think that that means we all think that um, the industry is empowering and it's happy hooker land and this, that, and the other thing. But many people fighting for sex worker rights um, are doing it because it's the, the best work that suits them or the only work that they have found in very, very difficult circumstances. And they just need to be able to do that as safe as possible. So this was a woman's story of, you know, um, having a mortgage that she needed to take care of and three kids to, to raise when she finally was able to leave her violent, abusive husband and, that, and, and, and stop relying on him for money. And that the way that she did that was, was doing sex work. Right. And she, she wishes that she had had other options. But she didn't, and she rails against the Irish government. You can bail out the banks, but not the people. You know, she, she's, she is frustrated that this is the work she ended up with, but she's demanding that she be as safe as possible to do it. I, uh, I uploaded this PDF as a handout, so because it might be a little bit difficult to read on your screens at home, but you can take a copy of it and take a look. So um, let's uh, see what's next here. This fella. Mm. Yes, um, that's a client. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And again, I, I thought this one was kind of interesting because um, it was bold, first of all. Um, but also, I think for, for herself, who, who took it, it was that um, I don't think she was expressing that she thought people wouldn't realize that this was on an overnight and that she was in the other bed in the room, that it's not like she oh. is forced to have sex with him all night long kind of thing that, that she, um, she's like, Oh no, we get our sleep, you know, and he wants to sleep too. I mean, he has a person with his life as well. And, um, however people feel about their, their clients, I think the pic picture is so, um, innocuous yeah, that it, day. Yeah, and yeah. it does kind of speak to the to to that um, reality that that um, that we're looking at a very uh, wide variety of people who purchase sex, and sometimes they sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we hope. Exactly. Yeah. This is probably my favorite, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just because it's it's mundane right yeah. it, you know what it's funny you say that because it's also so uh so special and important because what it is is two of the uh girls who participated in the project having lunch together and it's just this moment of what we do um what we find that we can do to put the head above water uh, when, like I've said, we do work that's very lonely and isolating, and when we can't tell people the work that we're doing. So through this project, these women have met and now go for lunch together um, when they're on a break from work or in between clients, and it's very fortifying uh, for them.
right? Right. It's great. And Monday, you're right. They're having what are they having? Lunch? Something. Yes. Shrimp. Prawns. Prawns, as you can say it. <laughs> yeah. This is a beautiful. I mean, this, you guys, this thing was. It was massive. It was uh, three and a half feet long. And this is one of the participants who really just ran with the project and took these insanely gorgeous pictures and was just really um, particularly poetic and dug quite deep, which again, we didn't, um, we didn't expect that of people. We said, this can be whatever you want it to be. It's something I learned from you guys from the Center for Artistic Activism to just, to just let go and to just, let it morph naturally into what it was going to be and um and so for himself these pictures were just so beautiful and he was re really expressing um the the depth of feeling that somebody can have um in, in relation to their work and in relation to their life and their coping mechanisms for what is a space of survival for them and but this person this other picture from this person, these big posters that we ended up mounting um, were, were very kind of cheeky and, and cute. And it was about him waiting for his clients and, and speaking very, um, very sweetly of them too, but also, also a lot of Netflix too. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this next one you have is a, a Twitter post of the installation and it includes a video and we don't, uh, this system doesn't handle video very well. So for our audience, I'm pasting in the link to this so you can watch the video, but it's, it's basically like a, a panorama of the, of the actual installation, right? It is. You'll, you'll see a guy in the very beginning who's eating in the corner. And by the time I come around to the end, he's eating in another corner. And I think he just came for the food. So, um, <laughs> It was as the exhibit was starting, and so um, there came a lot more people after that. But um, yeah, you can just kind of get a vibe of the room as people are starting to absorb what's what's on the walls and talking to each other, and it was really special. So I've got a question for you from Addy, who is writing, I think, from Austria. And Hi, <laughs> um, she wants to know, Kate, did you uh, consider other spaces that were not specific to LGBT um, uh, or was that a choice for the work to speak only to that area of the community? Mm -hmm. Or did, I mean, and is that true? Did it only speak to that area of the community? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we're planning on putting the exhibit up again mm -hmm. and doing it in a space that might be um, reaching audiences that we mightn't have had. Um, so spaces that are m much less niche than than that, um, than that building. They are wonderful allies for us, and so it was affordable, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and um, and also, um, also we kept it up for a month, and and that oh. space they host um, for for LGBTQ um, people. They host, um, you know, I think they even host like a. Um, sports club meeting or something like this. They host AA and NA. They host um, parenting groups. And so we knew that there was going to be a lot of traffic of people who mightn't come across it anyways, but um, still LGBTQ. Right, right, right. right. Um, well, so Ariane, Kate, I want to say thanks. And um, we we have a, a an audience here that might have some questions and i encourage you in the audience to write in questions anything you're wondering about for ariana and kate into the chat and as or into the uh questions thing on that there's like a little column on the right there's a thing for questions type those in and we will ask um and while we're waiting for that um let's do some business stuff so um, coming up with, um, do you have any transgender EU? Do, do you guys have anything coming up? Uh, so for transgender Europe, actually, what's uh, kind of a major thing that's happening right now is we have registration open for the uh, biannual, so every two years, uh, uh, tra European Transgender Council. Uh, yep. It's like the gathering of trans community and allies in Europe. Um, 
And yeah, registration is open now. There's for the next 10 days, the scholarship applications are open as well for those who can't cover their own costs. Uh, there's even a call for like facilitators and various ways to get involved. Uh, there's also an article posted, I think yesterday, about seven reasons to uh, attend the council. So if you want to check it out, uh, just go to cgo.org and you'll see that. And I asked you before um, how we could, how the, if this audience was interested in, in helping out, what were the ways? And we made a little list. So can you explain some of this? Uh, yep. So for Transnet or Vulcan specifically in this region, um, yeah, so we have a website as well, transvulcan.org, and you can find us on Facebook. Um, so in this region, Twitter is actually not something that we use very much. So, uh, so that's why we use Facebook a lot more. Um, so you can find us there. And what we're doing now is we're planning to launch, like in a few weeks, uh, early May, uh, we're planning to launch a fundraising campaign um, because we also have like a regional gathering for community because often our community members here in the region especially are not out. And some of the issues you spoke about, Kate, resonated very much with me as well. Um, there are so many people in the community who just cannot show their faces because they risk violence, homelessness, and so on, um, and or losing their job, and you know, so many things like that, like this. And um, so we're going to be doing a campaign to basically focus on enabling people to come together in a space where they can show their face with other trans people and allies. Um, so we do this like once a year gathering of people from the region, where usually it's about 60 people come together and exchange is really usually empowering. Like for me, the most humbling moment is when people come up and say like, this is magical. Like this is coming to a world that is just a glimpse of what the world should be like. Um, the only sad part is that it lasts like three days. So usually, you know, after that, we have to go back to our uh, lives as they are. Um, but at least we can contribute to making it, you know, better for a few days a year. <laughs> Great. Um, and Kate, this is the uh, Sex Workers Alliance. Oh wait, we have one more thing that we should talk about, the um, the fundraiser thing. Uh, yeah, so for the fundraiser, yeah, I didn't mention like there's going to be a community be contributing like art. Um, so both art can be contributed, but also donations can be made. And that art then can be, like there will be, I think, prints and stickers and t-shirts and so on that uh, people can get uh, kind of award for uh, funders for donating to the cause. Yeah, so if you're an artist and you want to um, provide an, an, uh, an award or, or a reward or an incentive yeah. for someone to make a donation, that, that's a great way to contribute. Yeah, so you can um, like, uh, find our email or Facebook message or whatever. Yeah. Great, cool. Um, and with uh, Kate, you have the Sex Workers Alliance Ireland.org site, and we talked about what how our audience could support Sway, and we came up with this list. And if you don't mind just going through it, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's the first one. For um, again, that's um, as I was talking about the FOSTA and SESTA, that there, there is a lot of um, criminalization tactics that are occurring throughout the world um, on the sex industry in the name of anti-trafficking. But for example, in, in Ireland, we already have tra trafficking legislation that was um, ignored and instead they um, slapped on this criminalizing the purchase of sex, which as you said yourself, it um, pushes people underground into the um, areas of the industry where human rights abuses are most likely to, to occur. So, so I would suggest that, you know, that when people are looking at anti-trafficking um, information or organizations that they really scrutinize it and that they, um, if they're concerned about sex workers and if they're concerned at um, exploitation that occurs in the sex industry to engage with sex worker organizations themselves um, to find out from them what it is that that really will um, best help the people who are in the worst off scenarios um, in the sex industry to find out from themselves because for a lot of people it might be counterintuitive Absolutely. and the dominant discourse has been this for so long right 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 you know we, um, are, we are at time and oh. so um, which is incredible because it means that we've been so engaged with all of you. 
um, through this, uh, throughout this. Um, the one thing I just want to, it's not a question, but it's a comment by Cece from New York, who I just want to read off, which is she says, one, I'm, I'm so inspired by the work that you, both of you are doing, but also I'm inspired by how, even when things change, the creativity remained constant. Oh. And I think that's a really nice way to think about both of you and what you did is it's like things change, but still that impulse to approach everything creatively, approach things optimistically, instead of saying, oh, our original plan didn't work. They, let's just scrap the whole thing. But like, okay, terrain has shifted. We're going to create something else. It is very inspiring to work with both of you. Ooh, thank yeah, you. I'm really glad to have you both here. Um, uh, there were some other questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them, but um, it's always good to like, you know, ha have a lot of a lot to talk about um, and keep up the work. You know, Ariana, I was going to tell you, Steve and I are coming back to Macedonia to do some work. Maybe we can should definitely the same person. Okay. Yeah. We'll be back in Ireland, Kate. Don't worry. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so thank you, uh, Ariana, and Kate, and thanks to all the folks in the audience for taking the time today. And um, and you're getting rock on messages from the audience. So, <laughs> all right, thanks a lot. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.